I, for one, by virtue of a testimony, am firmly convinced that if we ever lived in a day where we better get back to the Word of God, it's the day. There are so many things which are clamoring for allegiance. One message after another. One voice here, another voice there. Simply boiling down to the fact, setting aside him that speaks. The plea. Don't tip your hat tonight. Don't tip your hat spiritually to the Word of God. Because if you do, observe, if you will, beginning from the middle of verse 25 through verse 27. The power that's related to the word. And in verse 25, observe these two things which are set in uh, somewhat a contrast. For, here's the explanation, for if they escape not, who refused him, who declined him that spake on earth? Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Now, as you ponder this portion of the book of Hebrews, in view of the fact to whom it was written, the recipients and the contents and all, we have in view, I believe, as far as the first chapter, and the whole burden of the book of Hebrews is concerned, we have the Old Testament revelation set in contrast to the revelation in these last days spoken in the Son. And particularly, would the Hebrews who received this letter be perfectly aware of the fact of God's revelation as he spoke through Moses? And as far as the Old Testament and the revelation that's given through Moses, as well as angelic beings and etc., as we've noticed some of these things in their context, we suggested for you last night, I believe it was, to remember Numbers 15 where the man went out and picked up a few sticks. God's message upon the face of the earth through Moses to the one who transgressed the Sabbath law was dead. That's in connection with the warning of Hebrews 10 also. Now, if they escaped not, and they did not, folks, they absolutely did not, every transgression with reference to the Word of God, received the judgment of God upon them. The spies came back and gave the report. They said, oh, we can't go in. Then God pronounced sentence, I'll write a year for every day, 40 years, and it'll be a funeral dirge for you. And when they received then, if you please, the sentence of God because of the rejection of the Word of God, they said, oh, let's get up and let's go. Yes, yes, let's do it. And most of not in your life. You rejected it. God will be with you. Oh, but let's go on anyway. Let's go on. So they went on. And immediately, they were defeated and many slain. Folks, the Old Testament is such an object lesson of God's judgment for those who refuse the word of God. Now, if they did not escape, and that man that just picked up a few sticks from our point of view, God said, take him out and kill him. And they stoned him to death. Capital punishment for transgressing the word of the Lord. What would happen today if we had immediate capital punishment for those who would transgress the word of God. I guarantee you one thing. There would be a whole lot less people professing Jesus Christ and a whole lot more possessing him. There would be lots of changes with, with reference to some theological institutions that I know of. <coughs> now because they did not escape. Notice the comparison. Much more. Not on 
even an equal plane. But much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Here it is, a direct reference to chapter 1, verse 2. As God has spoken in these last days <clears throat> in a son, his own son from heaven's glory. And today, today in light of such a wonderful New Testament revelation, such flagrant rejection with a polite tip of the hat. No thanks. No thanks. Don't forget the one. If you are going to put anything, absolutely anything, in front of thus said the Lord, you're on dangerous ground. Absolutely so. Tonight, folks, it would be a whole lot better if you not be than to be and walk out of those doors politely tipping your head to the window. <coughs> All right. You're under great responsibility. <coughs> By virtue of this passage, under danger of greater judgment, too. Now let's go on. As we notice, verse 26. And observe, if you will, now a comparison and contrast with the things shaken on earth and things in heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Now, I'm not too sure that we can pinpoint a specific reference in the Old Testament concerning this first portion of verse 26, but I would like to suggest for you that possibly this is a refer reference to the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus. When you have Moses, God giving Moses instruction with reference to coming upon the mount to receive the, uh, the law. And uh, there was instruction whereby no one could come but just so far. And then when it was time for Moses to ascend, we read of the thunder and the shaking of the mountain. Possibly, this is a reference to that incident. Anyway, we know this. That his voice was that which was able to shake the earth. Now, not only in a literal sense, as far as the shaking of the elements, but also he shook the earth in the Old Testament times by virtue of very shaking judgments, such as upon Egypt. And as far as that concerned, in the various uh, captivities and the various uh, enemies of Israel, uh, there wasn't, uh, they simply uh, absolutely succumbed to the voice of God. Now listen, his voice did shake the earth. Literally there in the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus. Now then, but now he's promised something. Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Now I'm not too sure that I can really go along with some who suggest that this is a reference to the second advent of the Lord, although that uh, there's going to be some amazing events transpired when the Lord returns because the stars of heaven are going to fall and etc. and uh, the Mount of Olives is going to cleave and to be sure there's going to be many, many things uh, transpire as far as the elements are concerned. We read as far as the islands of sea, they're going to be removed when he returns. But I'm wondering if this is not a reference to Second Peter 3. Shall we turn back to that portion? Hold your hand right here in Hebrews chapter 12 and in 32 Peter chapter 3 where we read these words beginning with verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with her and eat. Now whatever this passage may refer to by virtue of direct interpretation and context, we certainly do know that the word of the Lord one of these days is going to simply evaporate the present elements as far as the earth and the heavens are concerned. Now, don't you see the emphasis of the passage? God has, in days past, shook the earth by virtue of simply his word. Now, as we read in other portions, the present heavens and the earth are reserved unto the great day of judgment when God's voice will utter forth, and they will dissolve, as we have read. Now listen. God will speak, and it will be so. It is such a message, such a word, a word of power, that you and I are exhorted not to tip our hat too politely. I don't care how piously. But bless your heart. Does certainly... Dear people, and then in verse 27, he says this, And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now then, what are the things that are going to remain? We have observed in these various portions of Scripture that we have alluded to and suggested that the present heavens and the present earth will be removed by virtue of the power of the Word of God. <laughs> now then hold your hands here and turn with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where I believe we have a fair illustration of what he means. <clears throat> now let me begin reading uh, with verse 14 of the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you have a passage which deals with the ministry and the service, and uh, there are some most important things mentioned here, but we, that's not for our purpose. I just want to point out something in connection with the passage in Hebrews. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, I realize there are so many other passages that we could uh, uh, refer to. But I believe this will suffice for us to see that God has mentioned over here in verse 27 and uh, the things that are going to be shaken or going to be removed are the things that are made, the things which are created. But now those things which cannot be shaken, they will remain. And those things that will remain by virtue of application in response to the Word of God concerning the practice, and we are in a passage dealing with practice, we are to have a life that's occupied not with things that are made, but things in the heavenlies. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ said it, at the right hand of the Father. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. But right now, what are we doing with reference to the practice, our life, in relationship to the Word of God? Well, you take inventory in your own life. What is the occupation of your life? What are the motivations of your life? What's the dedication of your life? Are you occupied with things which are eternal? Or are you occupied with things which are temporal? Now you Jews, I think much of this.
God's word is very powerful, folks. You can either choose to walk in light of the eternal things of the book, or you can choose to walk a pathway that's going to be totally destroyed. Does he not tell us? Lay not treasures upon this earth where rust and moth corrupt and thieves break in his feet. But lay your treasures up in the heavenlies where there's neither rust nor moth, where thieves cannot break through and steal. You're only here for your three score and ten. And if reason by strength, he gives you a few more years. What's your life amounting to now? What's your occupation of life? And believe me, it's got to be an absolute strict accord with the book. There's the power of the word. Now observe the, observe the practice of it in verse 28. And I'd like to suggest for you that you have a wonderful divine standard of practice. If you will not tip your head to the word of the Lord, but you will, Right. And may I read it as it should be? Wherefore, receiving an unshakable kingdom, when you're born again, you're placed into the very family of God. The very moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you become a child in the family of God, this wonderful, glorious, eternal kingdom of His. Dispensationally speaking, you become a member of the church, the body of Christ at the present time. And very, very soon, he's going to return to take his church home to be with himself. There's going to be that beckoning call from heaven's glory. He's going to be snatched up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Wonderful anticipation for us. All right? Having received that which is eternal, an unshakable relationship, an unshakable possession, an unshakable position, on the face of this now, Please notice the exhortation. Let us hold grace. Let us hold fast to grace. Now I want to stop right here and as kindly as I know how, ask you to be very careful with this. There are those that are called grace preachers. They are no more grace preachers than anything else. They are licensed preachers under the guise of grace. And you're going to see at this point here what holding fast to grace is. Now observe it. By which this wonderful grace wherein we stand according to Romans chapter 5. A perfect tense. God placed, God has saved us by grace. He placed us in that position once and for all time, and that position continues to remain. And we are in a position of a relationship whereby we pass under the graciousness of the heart of our great God. Hold fast to that wonderful relationship. And my, how powerful this is with reference to the recipients of this letter. The Jews wanted to mix law and grace and etc. But hold fast to grace, not to law. Don't hold fast to license either. You throw that out because you'll see license is completely eradicated here by virtue of what follows. Whereby, or by which, by which what? By which, by this grace, that we may serve God. And you know what this word serve is? It isn't just to be busy for him. It isn't just to work for him. There are many Greek words which are translated work and to serve. But this particular Greek word is to serve him worship. How I love the conclusion of this final warning passage in the book of Hebrews. Having such a superior revelation and reading, the one who dare trust him, the one who dare hold fast to his marvelous grace, the one who will serve, the service that's emphasized here, folks, is a service that is not a job. 
It's not a service of labor. I'll tell you, folks, it's a service that brings us right in to that wonderful relationship that we have at all times if we will avail ourselves of it. That is that service. And the Holy of Holies, behind the veil, the veil of memory, into the very presence of a holy God, with attention, folks, if you get conscious of the fact that your service is to be a service of the Word of God in the presence of God, in the holy holies of God, I guarantee you, you won't have a philosophy of license. You won't have an attitude of shallowness. You won't be fostering, or you won't be involved, and you won't be cowed down. and around this just so long as we are the number one. But you see, to worshipfully serve God, well, your attitude immediately changes. And you see that it is not you to be the one to be pleased, but all that his dear heart might be free. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul states this, Oh, I'm always ambitious that I may please him. Dear ones, you know I love you. I love you in the bonds of Christ. And I mean it sincerely. But if you don't know what it means, to have the heart of God to be brought with joy in your service. And I'd like to suggest to you that you need to have a revamping and a spiritual overhaul. <clears throat> you need to do a little introspection. You need to get down to business. Is that dedication really true for you? Is it? Don't answer me. He's the one that's throwing my heart right now. You know? All that we might worship. Serve him worship. Or by he. He might be well pleased. His dear heart true. Doesn't it really that there's a possibility that you could serve in this way? I'll tell you, it makes my heart drop with joy. And I don't care the standards out there, I don't care what little click you got going there, and I don't care what's there or some uh, one's prestige or lack of it. I'm not interested. But I'm sure interested in what God says. Because here's the only standard that I can trust to. I can't trust myself. But I can sure find his mother standards. 
And then it goes on thrilling him, well pleasing to him with reverence. And that which is behind this word reverence is devotion. Now let me ask you what devotion is. Isn't devotion that which is a manifestation of the very heart of your being in total occupation? You see, when his heart is first in view, then it's my heart that comes in to a union by virtue of practice in light of the word. In devotion. Not in arrogance. Not in pride. Prestige, position, academics. Orthodoxy today is so cold and so rotten. It's one that God can stand us. Don't you slip through orthodoxy as far as it's been orthodoxy. <laughs> but it had better have a part of it. And I keep hammering, hammering, hammering to our students at North. Yeah, you can get out of Northland College. You can, you can pass your exams. You can get your degree. But you'll be the most miserable failure in all the world if all you've got is right here. If you don't have a life and if you don't have a heart that matches <coughs> the lovely love letter of heaven's glory, you won't be worth your salt. <laughs> not only thrilling him with heart's devotion but then observe the last and God is here I think possibly one of the best ways to translate this would be godly all struck with his majesty So great, so marvelous, so wonderful, and so precious, <clears throat> as if in his presence we are struck dumb, speechless, and we stand in the presence of his holiness. And he says, God, we are. Will you so practice his loving word? Will you? Or are you going to take your hand? You're here tonight and you're going to take your hand. How carefully with the last verse. For our God is a consuming fire. <clears throat> I'm sure I've illustrated this before we get the bear with me. <clears throat> As one morning Jack and I had finished the chores, walked back up on the little hillside where we cleared some brush out. We stopped to look over the Goody Valley, the Goody River Valley. And our attention was drawn to a column of smoke lifting its bellows heavenward. I said, Jack, I didn't look like a bonfire to me down there. He says, me night. And we had no sooner stated that until we saw a huge black roll of smoke mushroom come up. We ran for his car. We drove about a mile and a half. And there before us, one car beat us. We jumped out, and there was a cabin, a plane, a 
a house just to the left of it. I heard a woman screaming in hysterics. And I saw a man standing just almost at a window. And on the back porch of the house waiting. And I ran. Is there anyone in there? Yes. There's a mother and a baby daughter. The whole roof was in flames. I took my coat, held it in front of me, and tried to go to the front door. And just as I was about this far from flame shot out the windows and right out that door, and I'll guarantee you one thing. You can't go against flames. I reeled back. I couldn't go anywhere. You could hear no sound whatsoever. Because by this time, they had finished. But to stand there, stand there, and know inside of that little cabin, there was a young mother and her baby daughter being cremated off. Now, folks, it was All we could do was try to keep the fire from spreading, move some of the um, equipment away from the burning building. And then I took <coughs> my New Testament from my pocket. And I went up to the man in the back porch and said, let's sit down. I prayed with him. I tried to talk to him. To give him some comfort by virtue of not the fact <coughs> of the fire and the tragedy there before, which was his daughter Wall, the old rancher. But of his own spiritual need. He sat across from that table on his way back porch, absolutely stunned. Nothing was said. Absolutely. So I spent what little time I felt as I should then prayed with him again. There was nothing more we could do. So we went home. <clears throat> a human tragedy. A real tragedy. But nothing. Nothing <laughs> compared to the tragedy. For you. Say, why don't we? You may not accept this point. I guarantee you, you believe it only. Don't you trust the monster? Don't you believe in the heart of Jesus? Died Christian for your sins. Then, one of you raised him. And ever lives to the first of you. Would you believe? And then, dear brother and sister in Christ, would you tonight? Let the Spirit of God move across your heart stream. And whatever is needful for him to do, let your life be so separated unto him that you will serve him in worship. Not by virtue of what to please you. I want to thrill him in devotion <coughs> and in godly awe.
young people who are going to save some lives. Separate yourself from this. Take him here. Not an election. No, but yes. But it'll be a mess with relationship. in Christ. Now the God of peace. God again from the dead, our Lord Jesus. A precious great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood, blood of eternal. May he equip you. Equip you. And every good worshipful working in you that which is well pleasing in this sight.